Today, I'm talking with the vice president of the country's largest criminal justice policy organization. He is the father of two and the husband to the one and only Carmen Perez. I'm talking with Jay Jordan. I'm Aiden Nepom, and this is The Changed Podcast. Welcome to the Changed Podcast. Hey, Aiden, how are you? I'm good. I'm really excited to have this conversation with you. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me. You know, I would love to take for granted that everybody knows what you do and that everybody knows what the largest criminal justice organization in this country is, but I think that we both know that that's probably not true, (laughs) Would (laughs) which is a sad state of our real reality. Would you mind just briefly telling people a little bit about the important work that you do? Yeah, sure. So um, I work for an organization called Alliance for Safety and Justice. It's a it's the, the name speaks for itself, right? Um, we were founded in 2015, um, but prior to that, um, our flagship uh, portion of our organization, Californians for Safety and Justice, which I was the executive director of until March, um, was founded in 2012. And it was in response to prison overcrowding um, in California. One person was dying every week from a preventable medical condition um, okay. uh, due to just too many people in prison. And so, you know, uh, major funders in in California did a scan to see if there was any organization that could actually help reduce the prison population. At the time, California was going through a Supreme Court case. um, It was called Plata versus the state of California, which essentially, excuse me, was the, you know, if you think of like criminal justice reform, that was like the beginning of the the whole era of criminal justice reform. where the Supreme Court mandated California reduce its prison population because people were actually dying, right? It was a public health crisis. And so we were founded in, um, in that whole, you know, um, 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 soiree of just, um, you know, madness. And the first thing we did was we looked at victims of crime and we asked them what they wanted, you know? Like, hey, you know, crime was happening. What, what do you guys want? And surprisingly, we found that, you know, victims of crime wanted three things. One, they didn't want um, what happened to them to happen to anybody else. Two, they wanted people to be held accountable, but not in the sense of just like straight up punishment, but held accountable so they wouldn't do what they did to them, right, to anybody else. And so Mm -hmm. like rehabilitation and and harm reduction. And then three, they wanted to be seen, they wanted to be heard, and um, they didn't want things to continue to do, to, to, you know, be the same way. They didn't want more incarceration, more police. They wanted healing. They wanted prevention over just reactionary things. So those three things really compelled us to build our platform, which is looking at criminal justice systems around the country and state by state and seeing where a lot of these things just don't make sense. Case in point, and and I'll just leave this here, there are about 30,000 people in California prisons alone that have mental illness. Mm-hmm. You know, are, are mentally ill in prison, right? Um, and largely because their crime was driven by the mental illness. Those people don't need to be in prison. And we're spending $70,000, $80,000 a year to keep them there. That's a lot of money. You know, people with drug addiction, they don't need to be in prison. They need treatment, you know? Mm-hmm. People who are doing these crimes that are clearly because they are in poverty, like still in the bike, they need a job. They don't need prison. And so, what we do is look at those things and work with state legislatures and law enforcement and victims and, you know, system leaders and advocates and people with convictions. And, you know, we develop policies that safely reduce prison populations and reallocate those much needed dollars to things that matter, like education and victim services and health care and, and job placement and home ownership. And that's what we do. And we've been successful for the last five years. We've decreased prison populations across the country in multiple states by about like two to 300,000 people. We reallocated close to a billion dollars from like just wasteful spending on prisons and jails into like victim services and education. And we've been able to get about like 1.5 million people the opportunity to change their records when they get out after they serve their time and go on and live their life. And so that's what, who we are and that's the organization I work for. 
I think that's amazing. I don't think my listeners know this. You know this because you and I talked about this when we met, but I had a cousin who came through the prison system. Uh, You know, he committed a crime at 18 years old. Uh, No, I take that back. He was not yet 18, but they tried him as an adult anyway, which is a thing that happens in this country that people don't ever think about. The crime that he committed was like really stupid and it was motivated by being drunk and it was a bad choice and it landed him in in prison uh for two years and then soft time for two more and then he could not work in his field so the issue of justice is actually is it feels personal for me i imagine as somebody who works in this in this world of justice, of safety and justice, I think it's an important emphasis because you really do work a lot with um, with the victims of crime as well. I imagine you have a lot of thoughts on change, change that's needed, what it means to be changed through the system, what needs to change in a system. Just the word change has to carry so much meaning for you, but I think I'm jumping to conclusions. So I want to ask you what what does all of that mean to you? Changes, changes is is interesting, right? Because I think it was Heraclitus that said change is the only constant. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And and so like when I when I think about change, I mean it's the essence of creation. You know, it's 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 um, the architect's gift to us. It's um, the only thing that um, we walk with throughout our lives that it's consistent. You know, for me, change has been something, um, and just put it into the context of the world of safety and justice, it's something that um, it embodies this experiment of democracy that we're all a, a, a part of now, right? I mean, think about it, right? A hundred years ago, you know, the world was a lot different, right? Yeah, oh yeah. America was a lot different a hundred years ago, and it's because of change. But just before you even get to change, um, you, you got to talk about like motivation or like what propels change, which is so interesting to me, right? Yeah. Like, you have these things that happen to people. Like it compels them to change something. Just a story. Um, so when I was growing up, um, I had a debilitating stuttering problem. I mean, it was like insane. <laughs> uh, and this is why if, uh, I sympathize with Joe Biden, our president, because he he's, he has a stuttering problem. So I mean, this stuttering problem was like extremely debilitating and it was embarrassing. And I remember I was walking to school with my sister. <laughs> we were in elementary school. We went to Creekside Elementary. It was like a mile and a half away from my house. And we used to walk every day. And there was um, like these strawberries that were right when you turn the corner from my house, there were these strawberries. I used to pick the strawberries, I used to eat the strawberries. And one day, it was Valentine's Day, right? And I had in my head to ask this girl to be my Valentine that I really, really, really liked, right? And I was practicing in the mirror for days and I was stuttering, like, woo, 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 when I couldn't get it out because I was so nervous. <laughs> And so this day when I'm walking to, to, to school with my sister, I stopped to pick the strawberries and my hat flew off. And so I went to get my hat and my sister's running. And I'm like, hold on, wait, wait for me. And so she's like, we're going to be late, right? So she leaves me and I go back to get my hat. I get my hat and I slowly like fix some work. I'm like, I'm literally like procrastinating because I'm so deathly afraid of asking this, you know, this, this, this girl to be my Valentine. So finally I... Walk that mile and a half to the school, and everyone is in is is gone. And I'm like, ah. Oh. And the beginning of the school is where you do all your, you know, hey, I got this Twinkie. G- give me a moon pie. You know, like the yeah. bartering system. Like you figure out what's going to happen. You know, all the magic happens prior to school starting. And so, um, I get there and all the magic is gone. And I'm like, oh, I miss much because there's no way I'm going to ask her in the lunch line or at recess. Like I wanted to catch her by herself when everyone is out there at this, like this, you know, Harper's Bazaar of like kids before school. I'm, I, so I'm walking with my head down and I'm holding my hat and a, uh, a Windstar van, uh, a, a minivan pulls up and I instantly recognize that it's her. And I'm like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my, oh my God. 
and she like the sun was like you know it was like 8 30. the sun was like shining so she hops out and the sun hits the back of her head and she lights up like an angel oh my god <laughs> I'm like, oh my god! I swear, they were like, oh, like angels in me. Anyway, so. <laughs> and she waves to me, and I run over there, like you know, a little jog, and and I um I begin to stutter, I, 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 and she told me to slow down, and I slowed down. I asked her, and she said yes, and I never forget that. That was the first time that I can remember that. I initiated a major change in my life that changed the trajectory of my life. I mean, I get paid to speak. I, mean, I get paid, you know, pretty good money to use my brain and my mouth. Before, you know, I just, you couldn't dream of me using, like if you knew me when I was in elementary school, you'd be like, there's no way this guy's gonna public speak. He's not gonna be getting in front of thousands of people or hundreds of people, like he's not gonna do that. And here I am on the podcast because that one thing that motivated me to change was just her telling me to slow down. And I took it and I changed the change my whole life. So just thinking about when we think about change, like the it's it's almost like it's the 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 more important parts of change for me is what leads up to the change instead of the change itself. Yeah, I think that's a really great observation and an absolutely wonderful story. I mean I can practically taste those strawberries, let alone just the <laughs> heartbeats of that moment. Um brings up a lot of memories of the yeah like you said that that in front of the school before the bell rings moment that's so critical and to yeah. miss that ah I was right there with you I love that story um but I think you raise a really important point which is um so often we'll think about that particular thing that happened that particular moment as the inciting incident when actually it's all the stuff leading up to that moment um you know, we're like, we're going along and something happens. And either that moment that we remember is the beginning of something or it's the culmination of something. Um, but the idea that like, mm -hmm. okay, and then it changed or it changed and then that happened. It's it's not quite right because that change is, a, as you said, a constant just moving through that moment. What do you think would have happened if uh, if she hadn't pulled up in the van? <laughs> I mean, I I cannot say that I haven't thought about that, but I have, right? Um, and I, I, there's this strange thing about around like life. Um, cause I, I'm a I'm a you know, I'm a firm believer in of life being intelligent design. That's that's my philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, like like complete and utter intelligent randomness, right? That's is what I call it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's 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 um i believe it would happen again you know mm -hmm. yeah i like there there's been many times where um it's like life is like a merry-go-round and you have like the pink pony and you're like oh i'm gonna hop on a pink pony and you just wait and you can't get the pink pony and you're like oh i missed it and come back around the pink pony again you're like i'm gonna hop on i can't do it so like that pink pony just keeps coming around i think they, that pink pony would have came again Right on. I, you know, I spoke with another guest in the first season, uh, Madeline Ryan. She's the author of a novel called A Room Called Earth. And she also was really a believer in this idea that like, you can either take that moment or it's going to come back around. Like life is going to keep presenting you with that opportunity. Um, and I think that's a really beautiful idea. I, I'm one of the, I'm a skeptical person. So I'm like, well, all I know is this is what happened. I, like if if you were to ask me the same question about any number of my stories, what would have happened if I'm like, I'll make up an answer, but there's just no way to know. Um, my mother often says um, that, you know, things were destined to be a certain way or it was meant to be a certain way. And I'm always like, well, all I know is that's the way it happened. <laughs> you know, but I think it's a really beautiful idea. Yeah. Well, think about it, right. It's, it's, the moment we're in right now, right? Like, it was because the pink pony came around that got us here. And it, and and the pink pony in life, it may not be the pink pony that you saw the first time, right? But it's still taking you on this revolution, on on this ride called life. And like, mm -hmm. you're growing and you're changing as you go. And you're thinking, oh, I missed that opportunity. But the fact that you were actually able to say you missed an opportunity meant that you got another opportunity to actually say that, right? And so, like, 
I don't, I, there's like this, just this thread of life that's so beautiful and like, you know, consistent and perfect for me. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I have a hard time believing in right and wrong. Um, I, and because everything is in the moment, right? And it is our perception on how we view things that create this negative or positive connotation to whatever we're going mm. for. You know, um, for me, I've been through so much in my life that could be considered just really, really, really negative. And yet mm-hmm. I'm here, right? I'm here with a great sense of humor, right? You know, like it's, it's, it's like, that's beautiful. And that's the pink pony, right? It, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's not a linear life is not linear. It is, you know, zigzag and, and up and down and around and we're on this ride and we're like trying to hold on and we're trying to control it. And, you know, the architect is like, I, I got you. Just, just, just float like a reed, you know, be like, become water, you know? I love that label, the architect. It's a call to mind science fiction and creation and all the things all at once. I really like it. Um, do you believe in luck? Do you think that that's a thing? Or do you think that your mindset is what helps you have a fortunate experience? So luck for me um, has more to do about your preparation for the moment. Right. And just again, I'm a I'm a I'm a use this analogy over and over and over. I think it's a beautiful analogy of pink pony. But like, you know, like you just have to be ready. You know, you just have mm-hmm. to be ready. And 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 preparation can mean a number of things, right? Like preparation can mean, you know, if somebody says, Hey, you know, I have this great job for you and you know, you're like, Well, I don't have any experience, right? But you get into the job and you realize that everything that you know like prepares you for this job, right? You just become very good at it, right? That's one level of preparation where it's like just my experiences prepare me for this moment. Other levels of preparation is like, I'm preparing for when I go take this test. I'm preparing for, um, and then when luck comes in, I, I believe that there is this, again, I, like, like this, this, this very, con- like, uh, uh, you know, tangled web of possibility Right. And when you are going through this tangle web of possibility, luck inherently is in that, you know. Mm-hmm. So I, I live on the 54th floor of Midtown Manhattan. Right. I can see all this beautiful. I can see all of Midtown. It's it's, it's great. Right. And so I was, um, you know, standing up there and my very insightful and beautiful wife, by the way, uh, uh, as she, as she says, you know, what other people down there see as problems up here, we see as opportunity. And I'm like, that's, that's, that's poetic, right? I was like, that's poetic. Right. Yeah. And so I begin to look and for the opportunity, right. And I saw this guy arguing with the cop, the, the, the traffic cop that come that because in, in New York, like double parking is like occupational hazard, right? It's like you double park because you live. <laughs> In like New York, so everyone was parked. It just is what is what you do. So he double parked. The parking guy comes behind him. He could tell them fifty four floors up. So I don't know what they're saying, but I'm in my head. I can hear the conversation. He's like, "Hey, look, I'm coming, you know, coming out," and he's like, "No, I'm going to write you." I'm like, "No, I'm telling you thirty seconds. Give me thirty seconds." And the traffic cop is like, "No, no, I got to write you up. You're here." He's like, "No, no, no, no." So like this dialogue is going back and forth, and then I begin to look around. I listen to what my wife, like my wife's words, is ringing in my head. Like, where's the opportunity? Where's the opportunity, right? And if the guy would have just went, like, literally 100 feet, made a right, there was a parking spot right there, right? Oh, now, wow. Now, is that, like, is luck preparation? Is it perception, right? I just believe that we are a part of this, like, this this consistent like, ball of possibility. And depending on your perception and where you're, your, your elevation and where you're at in life and just who you are, like luck is just inherently a part of the process, you know? I, I think the pointing out perception is part of the equation. It makes a ton of sense. Your your perception of the situation from your perspective on that 54th floor is so different than the, than the guy who's just only can see what's right in front of him because he's too close to what's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, as a consultant, one of the things I do is help people zoom out so they can see um, 
a larger context or zoom in so they can see the details they're missing, depending on where the gap is. Um, but more people could use that in their personal lives, I think. Um, when I was a little girl, my dad taught me a trick that I think he picked up from, you know, something like S or NLP or who knows, but, uh, <laughs> one of these, one of these, uh, mind control -y type of, uh, tricks called creating a parking space. And your story reminded me of this, but creating a parking space is this thing where you're imagining that there's an empty parking space, just sort of like waiting for you right around the corner and you, and you visualize it nine times out of 10, it's there. But I think it's not because you actually made the parking spot, though maybe it is. Maybe there's a little bit of magic in the universe and you tap into it. I don't know. But I, my explanation for it is more that you're not worried about is there a parking spot right here. You're looking ahead. And when you come around that corner, you're, you've got that expanded view for I'm looking for that parking spot. So that when it shows up, you're like, see, I knew there'd be a parking spot. Yeah. And it just kind of reassures you. And if there's not one, you're like, ah, it must be around the next corner then. Um, as opposed to like, oh, all hope is lost. I visioned it and it's not there. And, you know, it's like, so I, I do think that there's this like taking that expanded view. And I think that applies as well to interpreting the the experiences of our lives, the changes that we go through, that taking that expanded view, being able to look back at the playground, so to speak, and being like, that started something. Yeah. That's neat. Um, do you want to pause this philosophical conversation and play a game? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, so here's the game. It's called Aiden asks you a bunch of questions and then you answer them as quickly as you can. That's a very long title, but let's go. And the first question is, cake or pie? Pie. And then again, as quickly as possible. Why? It's pie is like pizza and sweets. So you can get both in the same, you know? Oh, best answer. If you had to pick one favorite outfit for the rest of your life or one brand new outfit every day, but you never get to wear the same outfit twice, which do you pick? Brand new outfit. Why? Why? Oh, <laughs> um, because... You know, you could be have similar outfits if you liked it. If you like it. Oh, oh, I I like that. I like that. It, you know, it reminds me of what somebody said once. It was like, if you don't like the rules of the game, maybe you need to write some new rules. Uh, <laughs> I like it because it's like, yeah, I pick the one where I get variety, but also I'm gonna some of that variety's got to include something similar to this thing. I like. That. I like that. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> all right. When it comes to furniture arrangement, I think you just moved. You, you were telling me that you were in the middle of a move. So you've now completed that move, I think. Um, so this will be fresh on your mind. When it comes to furniture arrangement, is it like that's the place that furniture is going to live for the rest of its life until it's disintegrated or you've died or moved? Or is it more like that furniture is just where it is for now and you're probably going to rearrange it a bunch of times? I'm going to rearrange it because change is constant, right? <laughs> yeah. You see what I did there? I yeah. like that. Yeah. Read any good books lately? Yeah, I'm reading one now. What's, uh, is it a book you would recommend? Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's called um, Rules for Radicals by Saul Alinsky. It's essentially like a, you know, a liberal's guide to activism. Awesome. All right. Last question. Whoa. In a world in which travel is normal again, uh, I mean, you're probably already doing some anyway, but where it's like really normal the way it used to be, you get on the airplane and you sit next to a stranger. Do you put on your headphones and pretend to be in your own isolated travel unit or do you have a conversation with the person next to you? you have a conversation. Tell me more. Two reasons. One, if we're going down, I want to know who I'm going down with. And then two, <laughs> like in common courtesy, you know, we're 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 travelers together. It's 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 yeah, I'm a traveling man, so it's it's um you gotta know who you're traveling with. It's just, you know, it's common courtesy. It's what it's thing to do. It's a, it's a gentleman thing to do. Awesome. Thank you for playing. Aiden asks you a bunch of questions and you answer as quickly as possible. Uh <laughs> That that's the game. Thoughts, reactions, sarcastic remarks. 
No, I I I, I love it. It it, it uh um you know it 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 was questions that were actually relevant to me, which was kind of you know was that was that luck or was that just like <laughs> infinite possibility? <laughs> you know, I suspect those questions are relevant to everybody. Right. Yeah. I suspect. I you know maybe the travel one's not, but um, but everything else, you know, cake or pie. That's like that's a fundamental decision people have to make for themselves in this life yeah to the point where some people were like you know what i think instead of having to choose i'm gonna put my pie right inside my cake and yeah. i'm gonna have a pie cake in or whatever it's called yeah. so yeah. You know, that could be a wedge issue man you know you have some very passionate you know spirited debates about pie or cake so I, you know i'm a pie guy <laughs> all the way through and through. it's you know there's a lot of variety to be had there it's really i think the, the, the cake people are gonna also Talk about all the variety you can have with the cake, with the fillings, with the frostings, with the toppings. So you can, you can you can put everything you you have on a cake in a pie. Most of the stuff, right? But you can't have a pumpkin cake. You can't have a sweet potato cake. You just can't. You can't. You know? But you can't. You can though. You can pumpkin cake, sweet potato cake. Yeah. Oh yeah. Pizza cake? A pumpkin sp- you can't have a pizza cake. That is where I was like, see? that's the best answer I've ever heard because see? you pulled there that you savory into the conversation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. That's enough pie and cake talk, probably. Uh, yeah. I mean, I don't know. Maybe it's never enough pie and cake talk. But I think um, now I'd love to come back to uh, to more philosophy talk with you because I'm really, I'm, I'm really struck by some of your thoughts here. Um, I'm wondering... I'm wondering if we could zoom out, you know, taking that broader perspective on this idea of that constant of change. We see how different America is from how it was. If you had to guess where we're headed as a country, which is kind of an impossible thing to do, but not exactly. We have a lot of history to predict where we might go. Where do you think Mm. we might be headed? Oh, so... I'm going to take like the literal sense of where we're headed, right? So I'll start with, I, I see, well, we're split up. Uh, this country's split up, you know, two main kind of tracks here, right? Um, yeah. You have uh, like our political system and then our economic system. And that's how countries are made, political and economics, right? Mm-hmm. Like our governance and commerce, depending on how, how you're looking at it, right? So like, how people are treat each other, right, and and go about their daily lives, and then you know the 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 like the, the you know the barter system. And so ours is democracy and capitalism, you know, um, and just just putting that to a side, um, just wanted to kind of clarify, like this is how I view where we're headed as a country um, in those two pillars. But just like population wise. Mm-hmm. And there are more um, foreign-born, our 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 first-generation foreign-born are and immigrant babies than there are like straight-up American babies being born. So you know, in like thirty years, you know, Americans will look like a mix of me and you, right? Like most Americans will look like my son, which is like more brown skin, fair. Like, and you're like, well, are you? I, I, what are you? You know, and so like, like that's where we're going. Like, and 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 that was a great experiment at the beginning. You take out of racism and slavery and all that stuff. Like the idea of an immigrant America, right? You, you know, mm-hmm. everyone here outside of indigenous folks are essentially immigrants. We're on we're on indigenous land, and so you know that's the idea of it. It's like come here and 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 help us build this this magnificent um, democratized capitalistic society where you can be and do anything you want to do in the confines of the, of the law. And so the population wise, it's going to look very different. It's not going to be white dominant anymore. Um, you're going to have, if you look at the, the, the domestic um, like uh, micro migrations, right? Mm-hmm. You are beginning to see people move from metropolitan areas into more rural areas. You're seeing people move from the coast like who traditionally were immigrant in in more um, um, inward, and then people who are like inward moving to the coast younger. Um, you're seeing um, 
like baby boomers, folks who were raised in the 50s and 60s, are born in like the 40s, 50s, and 60s, that are really family tr- um, oriented and like mom and dad and you know go to college and buy the house. Like you're seeing those folks kind of die off um, or literally mm-hmm. like die off. And then the millennials and you know are, are, are beginning to have a different way of viewing things, right? Um, and so like couple that, like that population, um, um, just very clear, like what's happening with like the micro migration and the generational, uh, you know, um, you know, influx, like the, the generational change, you're going mm-hmm. to see that impact democracy and capitalism in very clear ways. Right. And we're seeing it now. Um, some call it disruption. I don't call it disruption. I just call it change. Right. <laughs> you see, you see what I'm doing <laughs> like CEOs, just a clear picture. Mm-hmm. CEOs are getting younger. They're not, you know, old white men anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, you are beginning to see, you know, women in a lot of like leadership positions, which is, by the way, great for this country. If you think about, I digress for a minute. You think about what men have accomplished. <laughs> Us men have started every single war, right? <laughs> So maybe it's time for us to take a step back and let women lead a little bit, right? And I think that's a great thing because like we are different biologically, emotionally, physiologically, and it it like our leadership styles are tremendously different. And not to say just mm-hmm. like, oh, all women are the same, but it's like, no, it's 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 a mix and there's genius inside of just being a woman for the sake of who you guys are, right? Who y'all are, you guys are. You who y'all are. Um, uh, us, us women guys. Yeah, yeah, us women guys, right? So so <laughs> who y'all are because just the nature of nature, right? Um and yeah. so you're going to see like this the population um change influ- influence our democracy in ways that you're seeing now where senators and congress people are getting younger mm-hmm. and more more diverse you're beginning to see um these ideas that were really espoused at the beginning of you know I, they, they're really espoused in the declaration of independence right we hold these truths to be self-evident that all are created equal and endowed by yes. the so nearly we're right and among these are life liberty to the happiness and get this this is what a lot of people miss governments are instituted by men replace men with people and um if at any moment that government <laughs> becomes destructive to its means. It is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and institute a new government, right? And so when 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 you see people, right, in the streets, when you see people demanding for expansion of rights and inclusion into the American, like, um, uh, uh, American experiment, right? Like, that is the right, like, and, that, and that's what it's for. And so, like, an inclusive democracy is where we're going and that's and that means a lot in terms of like you know women shouldn't have to you know not have free child care like free child like child care should be a right like i'm or- always fascinated when it feels to me like america which was such a i mean such a progressive experiment to begin with in so many ways feels so behind in so many ways and not, you know, we're not behind 100% of the world or anything like that. But, you know, when I hear of um, maternity programs in many countries in Europe, when I when I hear about um, mm. efforts towards uh, creating really inclusive workplaces where people really feel like they have a voice at the table, um, regardless of color, background, age, et cetera. When I hear about these things, then I take a look at what's happening in the States. It's happening here too. You can see lots of evidence for it, but you can also find lots of evidence for where we are, are still, um, still have lots of room to grow. (laughs) You know, like mm, we got some contradictions to what our stated values are, you know? (laughs) Yeah. So, so, so like the, the, the tension that we see now, the same yeah. tension we saw in the fifties and sixties, right? And the same tension we saw in the in the tens and twenties, right? It's it's the changing of the guard, right? Mm-hmm. It is it is a generation that came from segregation, right? That is literally like they're senior citizens now and they're holding on to power. And this younger generation, like me and you are like, wait a minute, this doesn't make any sense. Like we gotta change this. Like, racism is, is played out. That's old. Okay, we got it. You guys are racist. It's good, you can have that, but we're not doing that. <laughs> 
Like, like you do that in your own time. Do that, you know what I mean? Like, when you're not, you know, like, and that's what's happening now is people are beginning to say, well, wait a minute, like, everyone should be included in this. Like, we should have, like, these things that are fundamental and common sense that, you know, like, you know, if I'm paying taxes and I'm working, then, you know, I should be able to get health care and not pay, you know, crazy amounts. Like, so, so, like, so that's how democracy is going to change, right? It's going to be more mm-hmm. progressive. I, I, I hate to use the words progressive, but we're going to see a more human-centered government. Mm-hmm. It makes sense because in industry, human-centered is is at. I mean, the more we move towards uh, AI and mm-hmm. we have all of these automations happening in our work systems, the more human-centered design for the end product matters. So it makes sense that in our systems in this country, that human-centered design would also come to play that we want to think about what is what is the end user experience here at considering that the end user is going to be from all these varieties of backgrounds um, and all these varieties of stories how can we change how we think about things to uh you know from my perspective as a performer it's always like what are the audience's needs and issues it's the same thing as uh, a product developer being what's the user's needs and issues and we should be i think thinking about what are the people, not just like the slice, but what do we, the people, uh, want future we, the people, to experience as a result of being part of this country? I'm curious what you think. You've already seen some really exciting progress in the justice system. Um, do you think we're going to continue on this track? I really hope we will. But I always, I'm always afraid yes. of that back, that backlash, that backslide the fear-based decision-making. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, just in con- just for context, if you think about, like, th- so this is an era, right? Like the civil rights era was started in 1954, ended in about 68. So it was about like 14 years. You think about eras like the Renaissance period, like how long did that last? It was a long, long time because it was about culture, but think about mid-century modern, that was about like 10, 15 years. You think about like, you know, thing around, you know, prohibition, you know, again, like seven, eight years. Think about like, you know, civil war and abolition. Like, so you, like women's rights movements, like marriage equality. So these are eras that happen in, throughout time. Like we're, we started in like 2009 and we're in 2021, about 11 years in. Um, and so one thing that just like has one thing that people just have to understand about this era is two things. Like one thing is two things, right? So um, first is this is not about criminal justice reform. It's not. This is about safety. You know, I mean, I encourage everyone that's listening and watching Think about where you felt most safe, where you feel the most safe. Think about the place, the textures, the colors, the smells, the taste, you know, the taste. And think about, you know, those who you're with. You know, think about how those people make you feel. Right. Now, think about those things in the context of what we pay for to make us. $50 billion a year in California alone, right? Just California. $50 billion a year on the criminal justice system to make us safe. $50 billion on jails, prisons, probation, parole officers, stenographers, DAs, sheriffs, police, police cars, you know, all this stuff. And yet, the thing that, the place where you feel most safe, the thing that makes you most safe, has nothing to do with those things. Absolutely nothing. And so the mm. priorities are like so different. When I think about my place, it's at, when I was a kid, we used to go to Seaford Center. It was a, it was a community center. We used to go play basketball. And it was like all the kids and the girls were there and the coaches were there and my parents. And it was fun. And yet that is what kept me out of trouble for so many years. When Seaford Center closed down, it was a wrap for me. I went left. And when we look at the budget for public safety, it has absolutely nothing to do with preventing crime from happening. And so that's the first thing. This is about safety. 
And when we talk about safety as a shared value, no matter where you are at in this country, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, the cornerstone of all three of those things, safety. If you are not safe, you cannot lead your life. You cannot have liberty and you sure as hell cannot pursue happiness. And so what this era is about is about safety. When people get into the streets and say, I do not feel safe around police, that is a value. I mean, that is a valid concern because if you turn on, I mean, if you Google black people in America, you are going to see police with dogs. Like, it's I, so this is about safety and we're in an era to where people are making it a wedge issue about, you know, crime and um, punishment. And it's not. Mm -hmm. If you ask victims what they want, if you ask the public and you ask them a fundamental question, would you rather spend $50 billion preventing crime from ever happening or $50 billion on waiting for crime to happen and then dealing with it? So that's the first thing is like understanding that this is about safety. And we have a long way to go to shift the conversation from crime and punishment to safety, right? And budgets to focus on prevention and intervention instead of just response. The second thing is this, which attaches to the first point. It's extremely important for people to understand. Our entire system that we as taxpayers pay for only is activated after a crime happens. After. I just think that's so bonkers. The number of people that you talk to that were like, we called the police and they told me they could literally do nothing is so astounding. Yep. And I, I'm not, I mean, you can take race out of the conversation and yep. still be appalled. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Like, 100%. if you want to get really upset about something, get upset about that because we want to, like you said, we want to feel safe. Yeah, we want to feel safe. That, that's it. That's it. You know, and so I, I say something super controversial that I always get in trouble for if my my people on the left and then the people on the right are like, I don't know. But like, I believe that January 6th and summer 2020, the feeling like and the concern at its core that people had was government interaction with them. And one was through the lens of black oppression, and the other one was through the mm -hmm. lens of white privilege. Take mm -hmm. race out of it, they both had the same valid conversation that this government has went off the rails some way, and that is we the people need to reel it back in and say, this is exactly what we want. So when I talk about where yeah. we we're headed, that's the exciting part about change. I always say when uh, when fear becomes part of the equation, logic flies out the window. So to your point of pursuing happiness and pursuing um, life and liberty, if you're afraid, you can't do those things. And I think you can look at you can look at summer 2020 and you can look at January 6th. And and those are clearly in my mind, both fear driven movements you know one group afraid of losing all the things they think um matters one group afraid of losing their lives and loved ones and um, working backwards in time in case that wasn't super obvious uh you know i think that you have to give people a chance to feel safe in this world and i I love the work that you're doing so deeply. I'm also hyper aware that like time is flying, it's fleeting, it is flying from us. I mean, I, so, cause I'm just swept up in the conversation. I think this has been pretty remarkable. So rather than, rather than take your time for granted, I'll just ask you this. Um, well, for, I mean, first, I just want to say I'm grateful for your thoughts and I am grateful for your stories. Your stories have been magical today. Um, what would you like people to leave knowing, feeling, thinking about in regards to change, in regards, in regards to safety and justice, in regards to um, picking strawberries, you name it? What do you want people to leave with today? I mean, uh, growth and change is the essence of creation. And for any man, woman, or child to try to replicate that process is simply unnatural. You know, embrace it, be it, love it, know it and know that you are powerful beyond measure. 
um, in the words of Mary Edelman Wright, it is it is our power that we're afraid of. Um, it is it is it is the fact that in spite of all that's going around us, you are the one that you know is going to create history and you're making history. And so, like I I I, I want people to understand that you know what whatever you're going through in life, no matter what it is, and it can it can it it it, it can seem insurmountable. It can seem like you will never get past this moment. One thing that is the only constant is change and growth. And, you, and that will um, pass. And that pink pony is gonna come back around again. And you've gotta be ready to hop on. Thank you, Jay. This has been fantastic. Thank you for having me. often talk in broad terms about change on this show, but perhaps we should, because as we often say at the Art of Change Skills for Life, change is inevitable, progress is not, and you do make the difference. If we want to change the world for the better, not the bitter, then it really is time we start thinking about not just what we're afraid of losing or really what we're afraid of in general, but instead about what we want future generations to experience as the result of what we do today. Naturally, I'll have links to follow up on in the show notes for this episode if you're interested in this kind of big picture thinking or in learning the skills necessary to have big picture conversations. Because as Jay pointed out, we may be a nation divided on how we get there. But when it comes to a value like feeling safe, we all want to get there. As we often do discuss on this podcast, the simplest place to start with big changes is right here with the person in the mirror. You want to live in a world that's inclusive? Behave in a way that includes people. You want people to listen to you and hear you when you talk? Then you need to learn how to hear opposing points of view. And develop that skill of zooming in on the details and zooming out on the opportunities, because then you'll know when the pink pony on the carousel comes around again. I want to thank Jay, of course, for his thoughts and stories today. Special thanks go to my family for their love, support, and patience. To all of you, of course, for listening. And to all of the amazing Changed Podcast Patreon page members who I couldn't do this without. The Art of Change Skills for Life and Patreon member producer, Dr. Rick Kirshner. I'm Aiden Nepom, and I wish you the kind of experiences in life you're excited to tell stories about.